Welcome everyone. Um, you can introduce yourselves in the chat. And um, if you actually, we're actually gonna invite you to all be organizers and who else should be on this call? You can reach out to them, text them. Um, this is gonna be an incredible call, which maybe will change the trajectory, trajectory of the election. So we're all organizers here. Um, feel free to invite other people on. And look, I see people introducing yourselves in the chat and you can say something that's inspiring you or something you're worried about. Um, and we're gonna dive right in. We have, we have um, over 1,100 people RSVP'd for this call. Um, so we usually get about half of those. So I'm just gonna dive right in. Why not? Um, let's start start the first slides. We like to start on time. Okay, so welcome all you new people. If you're a new person, make some noise, welcome. We, MVP is a one-stop shop for strategically investing in local organizations that win elections and transform policy all over the country, invest in hundreds of organizations who've helped win hundreds of elections and hundreds of policies. And we are, um, you can go to the next slide. We are so excited to be here. And the theme of this call is what the heck are we gonna do? Um, and uh, yes, we will be recording this call. You'll get slides in the recording in a couple of days. You can use the chat for questions. Uh, we're not debating current events in the chat. Um, and after the call, we're gonna do something really exciting. The, the last people featured on the call are gonna be three of our volunteer donor organizers from all over the country um, who've organized over a hundred local events um, and are building local teams. You're gonna hear from them. And then we're gonna have half an hour of office hours, open office hours to talk about how do you wanna get involved? Do you wanna organize a house party? Do you wanna get involved in a local place or organize a local team? Um, so just huge shout out to our incredible volunteers, our incredible staff, everyone who worked to make this happen. And let's dive in. So, um, so we are pulling out all the stops in 2024. So in addition to trying to support local organizations all over the country, we are also doing strategic initiatives, strategic partnerships on all fronts, we're coming, we're pulling out all the stops to organize all the voters to win. Um, and on this call, we're just going to talk about four of those segments of voters um, with four of our partners. But actually, I want to give a shout out to, uh, yeah, if we talked about all of them, it would take three hours, but I'm going to want to give a shout. We're going to do a reproductive rights electoralization call, um, electoralizing reproductive rights. That is uh, June 26th, Wednesday, June 26th. You'll get an invite for that as well. And we'll talk about more of these in future calls. But for this call, let's dive in. So we have a huge challenge. We have a huge challenge this election. Um, it's, it's my 12th election cycle. This is by far the most difficult environment. And adversity is the mother of invention. We have a lot of adversity. So we have to do a lot of in inventing. Next slide, please. So if you think about the Democratic base, um, you can think of it. We, we just made this slide. I was like, so let's make a slide about this. You know, most of the Democratic base is in some version of disillusioned. And then you have us over here, the, 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 blue, the blue circle, the desperate people that are desperate to not have fascism. And, and also, many of us are very angry. We're, we're very angry and upset. A huge uh, portion of our base, not the majority, but, but a very important portion is very angry about Gaza and the horrific situation happening over there. And, you know, and especially with young people, with Arab, Muslim, progressive, Jewish, um, and, you know, affected progressive communities are very angry. And we, what do we do as doing as MVP? Um, and, and by the way, this is a Venn diagram. A lot of people are in all three buckets. <laughs> um, as a progressive community, our job is to hold together 
our entire democratic base, the disillusioned, the desperate, and the angry to stop fascism in 2025 and create a better future for all of us. So that is what we are here to do. And we are gonna introduce our incredible speakers who are joining us. And um, Hi, um, excuse me, I'm facilitating a call with a thousand people. So go to your room. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not really a thousand people. It's eleven hundred. Okay, how many do we have? Five hundred. Okay, so okay, so first we're gonna have um, that's my eleven-year-old Analia. We're doing this to save the future for you, kid. So go to your room. Okay, so first we're gonna hear from from. Hold on. So, excuse me. I really am. Um, having a, a serious conversation here. So first we're gonna hear from Jennifer Knox from Working Families Party. Working Families Party is a really big deal. It's arguably the single most important strategic organization in the sector, full stop. Jennifer Knox is brilliant. WFP has a dual role of engaging the multiracial working class and also convincing the left to be strategic about engaging in electoral politics. They have a big plan, a very big plan, and they're doing all these innovative things, and she's going to tell us about it and set the stage. Next, we're going to hear from Grecia Lima from Community Change Action, who's one of the best people in the country that helps community groups do electoral work. And I learn so much every time I talk to you, Grecia, and she's going to give a snapshot of their strategies with the wider multiracial working class democratic disillusion base especially in immigrant communities and especially their relational voter programs that they're scaling this cycle. Next, we're going to hear from Dakota Hall from the Alliance for Youth Action, which is the biggest, most amazing youth voter engagement organization in this country ever. And I'm not kidding, ever. And they have local partners in the battleground states and beyond. Dakota's incredibly creative, insightful, funny um, about the state of youth and student organizing. He was telling me about this Salulu is Delulu, some, some youth thing I didn't understand. <laughs> and of course, we know the youth are the most important constituency this cycle, the most important. And Dakota is doing huge strategic, brilliant partnerships with zillions of organizations, local and national, and trying to solve some of the really big adaptive youth um, challenges this sector. And finally, we're going to hear from Abbas Alawi. Alawiya from the uncommitted movement. I'm just used to saying your first name. Um, you say uncommitted? Wait, why, why, are, why are they on this show? Aren't they the ones who got people not to vote for Biden in the primary? Aren't they the abandoned Biden people? No, they are not. And this is a very important distinction. Before uncommitted came along, the only political voice speaking to people's anger over Gaza was abandoned Biden and genocide Joe and other things that were personalizing it um, and um, yeah, so uncommitted is a movement within the Democratic primary and party. Think of it like this. Abandoned Biden is kind of like Jill Stein. Uncommitted is like Bernie Sanders. Abbas actually even kind of looks a little bit like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Just kidding, Abbas. Okay, um, but no, Abbas has a long history as a Democratic staffer working for Andy Levin, Cori Bush, Rashida Tlaib, and the innovation, the genius of Uncommitted, and what they've said all along is they're pushing for their demands on Gaza within the Democratic Party, and they also very, are very, very clearly do not want Trump. They're very clearly anti-Trump, and they have a four-phase plan. Phase one is the Democratic primaries. Phase two is the DNC. Phase three is to, and I quote from their website, engage anti-war voters to fight fascism, save lives, and strengthen democracy through November in the fall elections. Got it? So that's phase three, which happens after the DNC through the election. And then phase four, long term, is to rebalance the relationship with the Middle East and make sure progressive voters, all faiths and backgrounds, Arab, Muslim, Jewish, and everyone has a seat at the table when policy is made. So this is a very innovative, important, high stakes, sensitive intervention that they're doing. And you can read more about it on the MVP blog and why we're proud to support this work and why we believe it's so strategic. So let me let me 
um, contextualize this a little bit with the next slide. Um, this is, uh, I'm work, you guys remember the bat signal? I'm working on bat signal three. This is a sneak peek slide from bat signal three. Um, and this is a really important start part of the strategy. I really wish I had come up with this six months ago because it would have saved a lot of people, a lot of uh, political malpractice and heartache. So what we have over on the left side of the screen is um, the, the one to four zone, right? Is people who are, are not, who are actively not supporting Biden, right? Um, so, and basically what we're trying to do is move people from the, the, um, the twos, threes, and fours, especially, into the five, six, seven zone, right? So the, the mistake a lot of people make who are like the Biden campaign and the operatives and those of us who are desperate to, to not have fascism is trying to ask people who are at a three or four, the double haters, right? The double haters who hate both candidates to jump all the way over to an eight in one jump and, and support Biden, declare their support for Biden. And that is malpractice. And it's creating backlash if you, you know, people who are influencers on um, on social media, um, when, when they, if they even mention Biden, people will, um, I can't remember the name for it, stitch, stitch, they'll stitch a video to it saying like, this is insensitive. And, and then the stitch videos will get more likes than the pro Biden videos. It's, it's, it's bad strategy. Anyway, so what we need is a two-stage approach. We need an emotionally intelligent approach to voter organizing and meeting people where they're at. We don't need people to be at an eight right now, right? This is gonna be a hard fucking election. The key to winning is meeting people where they're at and especially there are disillusioned, angry voters who are gonna decide the election and to create a permission structure to talk about how we're anti-fascism, how we're anti-Trump, get people in, in that conversation, right? Who do you hate more? And then in November or in, in the fall, there's time for another conversation. So that's the thing I wish we would have put out um, six months ago, because now we're having to dig people out of being painted, having been painted into a corner of being asked to support Biden when while they're looking at images of you know babies being killed um and that is the intervention that we're, we're trying to do so anyway so so let's dive right in um and Jennifer I'd love for you to kick us off um Jennifer is like a really big picture strategic thinker um and it's so great to have you with us so tell us I, I gave them some prompts so just dive on it I will. I'm so happy to be with you all. Thank you, Billy. Um, and everybody in the chat is wishing you happy Father's Day. A little early surprise with your kids interrupting, <laughs> but we love them. Um, uh, and I love, thank you so much for having me. Like, I love the enthusiasm in the chat and the energy. Um, I, yes, whoever said they're down for a road trip to Wisconsin, like, yes, do it. Um, so I'm Jennifer Knox, WFP's National Director of Organizing, um, and WFP is Working Families Party. I love that it's uh, that that's come up there. Um, and quickly about myself, one of the first identities that shaped and politicized me growing up was actually that of a big sister. Um, I'm one of the oldest of five kids raised in Madison, Wisconsin swing territory. And when I was 19 years old, a freshman at UW-Madison, my little brother was in kindergarten. And one day he and some of his kindergarten friends uh, were playing on the playground. They began throwing rocks and ended up hitting a parked car. The principal's response was to call the police, have the police wag his finger at them uh, and fingerprint them and essentially say, hey, you know, if you keep up this troublemaking, you'll end up in jail. And when he heard about this, my dad, a working class black man with no college degree in a college town, marched up to that school. He's that kind of parents <laughs> um, and was irate about the way that they treated a kindergartner because he felt, which I agree with, 
the way that you discipline a kindergartner is by threatening to call their parents and they will all reduce to a puddle of tears because that's what being five is about. That's the emotional <laughs> way that you handle things. Um, and when my dad get in, did not get the response that he wanted, he said that was enough and he took it further and he ran for city council. And so as 19, I was the treasurer on his campaign and I got all my college friends to go to the black neighborhood where I grew up and help elect him with 52% of the vote. And so the cause of ensuring that working people have governing power to make decisions over their lives that impact them is one that is at my core that I've been at for decades at this point. And yes, I'm old enough to have been up at it for decades. Um, and still to motivates me to this day as a passion project. And I'm very excited to be on the front lines uh, in Wisconsin and having WFP in the front lines in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and lots of places all across the country. Um, and Billy, I really deeply appreciate the, the introduction that you did. Uh, I want to lay out a little bit more about how we see this sort of set of voters from disillusioned to angry, and also to talk about some of the root causes of that, because we want to obviously defeat Trump and his fascist project, deal them an electoral blow, and ensure that it is one enough that can stick through contested uh, election scenarios and other, you know, uh, non-democratic attempts. Uh, but we also have to understand what are the root causes so that we are tackling those root causes and we don't just keep ending up in this situation again and again. I don't know about you, but I do not want 20, 2028 to feel like this again. So um, here is WFP's assessment of the main struggles in America. Number one is that there is an authoritarian white nationalist takeover of the GOP. Uh, this is not the old GOP. Its leaders and platform and its most animated voters represent a clear and present danger and uh, to our people and to communities across the country. This is a very real fascist threat. We are unapologetic in naming it. And we name it first because it, we name it first for a reason. It is of high, incredibly high, imp high importance. Uh, and we want to sound that alarm all across the country and to the extent that we need to convince people that that is true. So, you know, sharing Project 2025, right? I believe I'm speaking to the choir in this room and that everybody is aligned around that. Secondly, that much of the Democratic Party is controlled by folks who are not working people. The Democratic Party thinks of itself as a big tent with lots of people in it, but we can't escape the fact that some of the most influential forces in the Democratic Party are betting their electoral future, not on working class people, not on young people, but on winning over moderates in the affluent suburbs. And the problem with this calculation is that there are not enough of the, those people to fundamentally defeat the GOP. Uh, this is this strategy of their party is abundantly clear in the ways that they have abandoned immigrants lately. Uh, somebody was mentioning in the chat that young people are disappointed about the progress on climate change. And of course, uh, many voters, as Billy was mentioning, who uh, are angry about the absolutely frustrating and a situation that they're seeing go down in Gaza and watching on the screens, you know, and on their social media. Third, the Democratic Party is losing working class people of all races, working class voters, many of them white, but increasingly now black and brown working class voters are leaving the Democratic Party in a process known as class dealignment. Um, and this is many people disaffiliating with both parties or dropping out of politics altogether. And meanwhile, the Republican Party is able to pick up some of those. So this represents that like disillusioned uh, set of people. And, and we see that unfortunately growing this cycle. Um, and then finally, that we live in a two-party system that limits our room to maneuver and address all these problems. Our two-party system is a thing that is helping alienate masses of working people of all races from voting. It's just not possible for two parties to accurately represent such a large country. And so that leads to the disengagement of many people who feel not heard. And we need those people right now, and we will continue to need them. And therefore we have to, part of our strategy has to fundamentally address that. So the confluence of these four main struggles are incredibly dangerous, but I believe that we can and we will prevail if we work together. 
And so WFP is aligning individuals and organizations to construct a winning long-term electoral majority. And if we're able to successfully do that, that not only means defeating Trump, that that not only means blocking this fascist threat, but it also means building a majority that can actually govern our country in a way that engages masses of people instead of disillusions them. And instead of leaving huge segments um, feeling incredibly angry. Uh, I'll take the next slide. Um, and I'll just say that governing power is fundamentally about like a, a deep belief that the values that we have that are shared can carry a majority, right? And can then govern and um, can be put into policy over time. So uh, w Working Families Party, our goal is to create a new center of gravity in American politics. A lot of people will look at the map of American politics and just see red and blue. But we're trying to actually add to that map. That is, a, that is the heart of the matter of one of the things that's necessary for us to not only defeat fascism but uh, uh, in November, but get ourselves out of the sort of root cause predicaments. Um, we think that this is that adding the center of gravity is just essential to a long term, not just temporary re-engagement of millions of voters who are really frustrated, uh, angry, as Billy put it, and um, disillusioned. I'll go ahead and take the next slide. If you zero in on that little purple dot, actually, um, the a Working Families Party really looks not that dissimilar to the kind of dominant parties of our day. They have a similar coalition of mass organizations, of donors uh, that support, um, of unions, et cetera. Um, and uh, this means that in practice, when WFP moves, you know, well, first of all, that many organizations, many donors, many candidates ask Working Families Party, hey, what's what's the plan? What are we doing next? And that we move in alignment together. Um, one of the ways that we will do that this year is that this year, like every year over, you know, the past prior decades, we've done an internal democratic process that leads to um, an endorsement. And so we will navigate that process this year. We have found that very often us doing that um, gives permission for other groups to follow and to move their bases in alignment with that. So we will be um, doing an endorsement process that starts in July of this year. And in advance of that, we're already deep in the work of talking to many organizations and aligning a set of forces that will be powerful in your Milwaukee's, in your Detroit's, in your Philadelphia's, in your Phoenix's um, about standing up against fascism um, and, 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 and responding to the call that we think is absolutely critical in this moment to build electoral power to make sure that those disengaged voters um, are not disengaged by November. I'll go ahead yep, and take the next one. A little bit about, uh, I won't go in the weeds of all of our plans because it's deep, but um, a couple of tactical innovations that I hope will excite you about this season and cause you to feel like, while the dangers of 2024 feel unprecedented, so is our creativity and our rigor to organize in this political moment. So a couple of the things that WFP is helping lead in Again, this is not just with WF, WFP will contact millions of voters with our own programs this year, but we lead an ecosystem of organizations that will use our polling and messaging and our tools and tactics. So one of those, um, some of you um, may have seen headlines like this one that's shown about key Democratic Party infrastructure, this tool called VAN being purchased by hedge funds that are connected to the GOP. This tool allows so many things, us to track the voters we've talked to, which ones on our, on our side, did they go from five to three, um, and which ones went from three to one. It allows us to keep track of that uh, so that we know that it adds up to the number that we need, and then allows us to say, all right, which ones have voted and which ones still really need our, our reminder. So this is a tool that not just WFP, but organizations across the broad tent Democratic Party infrastructure use. And uh, now it's been threatened. WFP not only built a backup, but it uh, also went further to figure out what are the innovations that our field needs to win. 
Uh, one great example of this, I want to shout out to Austin, WFP software engineering director, who won two weekends ago the first ever progressive political AI hackathon in the Bay Area. And this is because he um, created an integration. It's a novel app that uses AI to record the process record essentially voice memos in these canvas or conversations and helps us turn it into insight. And this will help us to better aggregate a sense of what concern voters have, right? How many of us check off a couple of boxes after having a real deep conversation with somebody, but we need that information, right? To better um, aggregate a sense of what are the concerns and be able to more quickly respond. So we're very excited about that innovation being available this cycle. So if you want to- Time shop. Sorry, quick time check. Of course. Should I? Oh, no, keep keep going. Just do the fast version. Yes. All right. Got you. Will do. Can If you can pop the next slide, another quick thing, if, if you hit the next one, is this send a selfie relational program. Uh, if you keep clicking, it'll show a couple options, but we have an innovative program that will send, allow you to put your face on a postcard and send it to your family and friends. And long story short, it is tested, right? That we know that people look longer at something that has their friend's face on it and it's more compelling. Um, and then if you hit the next one uh, or get us to the next slide, the last uh, thing, uh, if you can just go ahead. Yep, there you go. Uh, and this will, I think Billy mentioned, will be on a future or future call is like these massive events at early vote and cultural organizing, because we know that joy and elections can also often feel doom and gloom. And it's really important for us to shift that energy. We know that we can persuade better and actually shift people better when energetically they are mo more open. And so creating those opportunities where voting doesn't feel like a chore or a responsibility, especially to our young people, but it feels like an experience where they are enjoying themselves and they see all of themselves crewed up and that actually they're incredibly powerful and incredibly necessary in this moment. So um, I look forward to seeing you all on the front lines. I really appreciate both the ways that you contribute financially, um, but of course uh, the ways that you also contribute with your bodies. So see you soon. Thank you, Jay Knox. Um, and uh, let's bring up Gracia, Gracia Lima from Community Change Action. Hi everyone, so happy to be here today. Before I share a little bit um, more about our program, I just want to express um, my deep gratitude for each one of you. I really don't take it for granted um, your active participation in this beautiful, resilient community that Billy and the MVP team um, continue to organize. I strongly believe that intentional community building is a core component of the path to victory, not an involuntary outcome, but a main component of protecting our democracy. So I really look forward to your questions and curiosities. So a little bit about uh, community change action. Over nearly 20 years, community change action, community change voters, uh, that's our political committee um, and our grassroots partners have built, um, just next slide, have built an electoral powerhouse. Today we remain focused on the same North Star, expanding the electorate and engaging hard to find, hard to reach Black, Latino, Native, API, immigrant women and young voters to provide support navigating the voting system and to motivate them to turn out for values aligned candidates. We know that what we have built is not yet enough and we're committed to cut through the noise and sustain our work through long, longer voting cycles to reach more voters and connect more deeply. We're building statewide programs in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, and Ohio with many of the state partners that you all already support but our layer comprehensive field is um, composed of large scale traditional tactics like canvas, phone, mail, along with more innovative strategies like relational voter contact, which, you know, shout out to Jennifer and the Working Families Party team that have also uh, put it to test. So thank you. Uh, targeted digital influencers and personalized mail. Our commitment is to effectively compete to win tough elections while strengthening the foundation of democracy. Next slide. So let me start with some celebrations. Along with our state partners, uh, we have already knocked on 327,000 doors 
and made 600,000 phone calls ahead of where we were in the cycle last time. Community Change Action through our digital acquisition program has recruited thousands of new volunteers, while some of the top lines that I'm about to share with you are a little bit hard to hear. I want you to still know that once we allow for the voters to be heard, to share their frustration, and we still invite them to do more, not everyone says yes, but there are thousands of people that are still waiting for an invitation to do more. We cannot waver our belief of the curative power of solidarity and organizing, not in this moment when we need it the most. So what are we hearing from voters? It is not the economy, it is the cost of living. People are having a really tough time. The rising cost of basic items, along with housing, childcare, healthcare, has many people in survival mode. In addition, we're always, as an organization, always super interested in tracking power. Do people believe in their own power to create change? Do people believe their vote has power? And we have added this as a question in many of our field scripts. As I am sure many of you have heard from Terrence at Hit Strategies, the concept of power and vote choice is a strong data point. While people are lightly hearing about the progress that has been made with the Biden administration, student relief, IRA investments, by and large, they're not making the connection that their participation in 2022 was the most crucial component to achieve this change. We have to recenter individuals and communities as the protagonists of this monumental progress. We do encounter Trump nostalgia. Things were not as bad. I was doing better. Cost-wise, it um, you know, my my household family was doing great. And my theory, this is not community change actions theory, but my theory is that there's some level of selective memory and trauma response. People are protecting themselves from how traumatic his presidency really was. Abortion continues to be a strong motivator and we will pair the messaging with some of our economic messaging, but people want to hear more about a vision of economic prosperity, not just a recatch of rights that they have lost. A couple of additional reminders for this group, voting starts in October. <laughs> Early voting, vote by mail, has forced all of our programs to get to scale at a much earlier time frame. You can chat with any one of us, but there are large gaps of political money for field programs. My current fear, the thing that is keeping me up at night today, is that we will run out of time to do the large scale persuasion we need to do with our voters. We're adapting to this reality and switching strategy to have a large scale phone program in July. This is going to allow us to quickly scale and infuse our Canvas programs with candidate IDs. Phone programs also give us the flexibility to segment different scripts and audience. And we will use this to test different persuasion scripts to train our Canvas teams and volunteers. Finally, there's a strong rift I am witnessing with communication strategies and field programs. We have to mend this to win. Next slide. The way that we have chosen to make an intentional pipeline of online to um, offline engagement is through our relational organizing program. I wanna give you the example of the day without childcare, which was our most recent action. And I will post in the chat a little bit more so that you can kind of poke around of just like this incredible event that we just hosted last May. But, the main takeaway I want you to find is that we found 3,714 new people, mostly from our targeted states that want to do more. They join our action and are now in a ladder of engagement to be part of our political program. Next slide. They will receive an invitation and engagement, but ultimately the goal is for them to have a series of conversations with their friends and family to check their voter registration, just um, and to talk about the candidates and to turn them out to vote. And just as I mentioned at the beginning, I really do believe 
that the power of community building, the power of organizing is best described and best impacted in this type of relational water contact activity. Trump nostalgia will be hard to um, force people out of it without having that depth of knowledge of the intimate beings. And, um, you know, like I was having a conversation with someone who was experiencing a little bit of Trump nostalgia and who's part of my own relational voter contact circle. And I said, no, you weren't. <laughs> you were not better off last time. Remember when you asked me for money? <laughs> like that was that was not your experience. And that type of challenge in terms of the conversations that we're going to have to have with our communities, the type of mending that we're going to have, I really do believe the power of relational voter contact is part of it. We are committed to building a relational voter contact program that will reach 250,000 voters who are hard to reach, most likely outside of the traditional campaign targeting. And we're still matching back into the voter file all of the new volunteers from our uh, active digital campaigns. But let me give you a data point. 35% of them didn't vote in 2022. These are exactly the type of sporadic voters we have to sustain our engagement. And we are committed to building a relational organizing program that has the capacity to do that and to add into the margin of victory. I have so much more that I wish I could share with you all, but I'm excited to be part of this community. I thank you so much for your active participation and I look forward to staying here connected. Thank you, Gracia. And so, someone asked me offline, why are we featuring national organizations instead of local organizations? And the reason is because we're all working together. You know, the, the groups that Gracia works with and that, that Jennifer and Dakota and, and Abbas work with, there are the same local groups we're working with. So they're, they're like, we're all co-strategizing how to support the, these groups and this organizing. So I wanted everyone to, to meet our like brilliant thought partners. Dakota, you're next. And you abandoned Wisconsin to, where are you now? <laughs> um, I, I never abandoned Wisconsin. Let's start there. First and foremost, Wisconsin is home for me. Um, hello, my name is Dakota Hall. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Youth Action. I'm currently in Montana, um, meeting with our uh, affiliate out here, talking to young voters um, across Montana about the issues that they care about. A little bit about who the Alliance for Youth Action is. We are a network a federated network of 19 youth-led grassroots organizations building political power for young people across this country. Um, at the Alliance, we help provide the continual support to local youth organizations dedicated to ignite progressive legislative and political changes across our country. Um, central to our strategy is the enhancement of local youth organizing um, power um, through robust network capacity building programs um, that are designed to strengthen the infrastructure and capabilities of youth organizing across this country and to enable them to be more effective and impactful uh, in their advocacy and electoral efforts. Um, so a little bit about like what, what, what we have going on this year. Um, first and foremost, young voters, right? How is it going with young voters is often the first question I get. Um, and we understand that it's not gonna be an easy election cycle. Young voters are fed up with a two-party system um, that they don't see champions fighting for them. Um, where we know there is an enthusiasm gap coupled with dissatisfaction on policy um, from the Biden administration um, around the economy and cost of living, inflation, jobs, abortion, Gaza, democracy, immigration, um, right? And we just got off like one month ago, you saw campus protest happening across the nation. Um, so I think it's very clear to say that young people are not necessarily disengaged. I want to fight that narrative, but upset at what's currently happening. I think young people are at the highest engagement level that we've seen in this country in a very long time, but they are upset at the direction in which this country is heading into, right? Even, you know, let's take a story about like how, you know, I was just with, with young voters in Arizona and how disappointed they are in, in the Biden administration, how they're handling the border, and they still see their families being ripped apart. And that simply was not what they were promised when they went out and vote in 2020. Um, and so, these are the pain points that I think young voters are dealing with is that they thought they were voting for a country that would be in a much different place than what we currently are um, four years ago. So that is something that I think is deeply rooted into what we're hearing from young people each and every day on the ground. Um, and so what does that mean for our program this year and, and how is our program gonna be run? Um, 
So the Alliance Network nationally and our local affiliates are actively running programs focused on persuasion, voter guides, educational campaigns across key battleground states. And for us, when we say battleground states, that is president, Senate, and abortion states, where we see abortion on the ballot to help protect reproductive freedom in our country. Um, and so for us, that's Arizona, Florida, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, Ohio, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and of course, my home of Wisconsin, number one state in the nation. And that looks like helping launching programs right now um, to help do education around what the Project 2025 manifesto is on Insta, TikTok, and Snap. Um, our strategy also includes um, intensive persuasion and mobilization efforts geared towards encouraging both moderate and progressive voters to actively participate in the 2024 election. Next month, we're actually launching focus groups in battleground states to help research the narratives that uh, we believe will help win um, this election and help inform our persuasion programs, um, depending on the demographics that we're talking to, because we know talking to Latino voters in Florida and Arizona are completely different. We know talking to rural voters in Wisconsin and Montana are completely different. Um, and we have to actually not just have cookie cutter um, language and policy platforms. We have to actually go to what people care about um, most definitely. Um, and so often the other question I get is, how is 2024 different from other years? Um, we actually learned a key to success in youth organizing in 2018. Invest early, invest into local youth organizing supported by national capacity building and funding. Since 2018, um, young voters have consistently broken voter turnout records at the highest levels that they've ever been for young people. And so we've faced historic challenges on youth voter disengagement in the polls, right? Polls are not necessarily are voting, right? And so, and we've also seen continuous attacks on youth voting, um, whether that's attacking campus polling locations, student IDs, early vote, et cetera. And while we understand the issues that are different this election than 2022, the systems still remain the same about how we have to build organizations ready to combat the voter, dis uh, voter, voter disenfranchisement, as well as combat some of these issues um, that we are currently not meeting our values on. And so what, is, what are some of those things that we're hearing? Um, top of mind for most young people is Gaza and Israel. And, and how do we actually move forward there? And how do we not um, continuously support um, genocide? Um, we also see continued dis dissatisfaction on other key policy items, whether that's cost of living, um, democracy, immigration. Um, right. Even today, as I landed in Montana, I had a chance to talk with a with a young individual um, who was um, just got done going to figure out whether or not they're going to renew their one bedroom apartment in Missoula, Montana, and they were telling me how they um, when they got to their apartment complex into the, the, the administrative office, they currently have a rent of $1,100 in Missoula, Montana. And to sign their new lease, their rent would have went up to $1,900 because there's no rent protection. And so these are the things I think young people are really fired up about. And he was telling me about how he wants to actually go out and figure out how do you actually create a local state or federal policy that actually protects people where rent won't go up more than two or 3%, right? And so again, I think these are just small examples of how young people care so much about this election and how deeply they're fighting for it. And so what does that mean for us in terms of scale? We're gonna be on over 200 campuses in 18 states, over 500 field staff and over 15,000 volunteers helping us um, do 150,000 voter registrations, mailing out more than 2.3 million voter guides, doing our pledge to votes, 5.3 million voter contacts, right? And so that to us is where we're really at, right? And what keeps me up at night um, a lot is thinking about the right, um, the right wing, winning men of color and how they've done tremendous work in the last six years to really pull apart a strong progressive coalition by attacking young men of color with disinformation and misinformation and using toxic um, language and, and sexism and misogyny and transphobia to really pull apart um, what was a strong coalition. Right. I think also we have to think um, about the disinformation with the rising AI and targeting youth on TikTok uh, and Snap and other platforms where um, voice recognition is going to play a huge role in this election, I believe. And then finally, I think what also keeps me up at night is Biden's not moving on policy that young people care about. We need to see more. We need to see a champion that we voted for. We need to go see a compassionate president that we thought we were voting for in 2020. And we're not getting that right now. And so how do we win? We're gonna drum up excitement about this election through events, swag, cultural organizing. We're doing voter registration to add the most diverse generation in this country's history to the voting rolls to ensure that we have diverse voices across every single state. We're gonna do robust on and off campus organizing and really go out and talk to every single young person that we possibly can, whether they're on a rural, uh, campus, whether they're on a commuter campus, whether they're on a four-year flagship campus, we are going to every single campus that we can this year. Um, what else is going to take to win C3 resources to educate um, young people about what life was like during 2016 and 2020? And what does it mean when young voters who were 10, 
to 14 are now voting um, and do not remember the presidency before this one. Also, we're going to need C4 resources to do the persuasion um, work with young voters to go out and talk about these issues and talk about what we've actually won in the last three and a half years. Well, I think we're really down on ourselves right now. We have to remember that we won a lot of important things in the last three and a half years, and we have to go uh, talk about that. And so the resources needed. Um, the Alliance has two campaigns that we're running to help support local youth organizing, help scale this work across many key battleground states. We have a C3 campaign um, that we had a target goal of raising $15 million for. Currently to date, we've raised 8 million of that and we've granted out 7.6 million and we have another gap of um, just about $7 million that we're hoping to push to the field, especially as campuses return this fall. Um, Grace just said it perfect. We're in the, some of the longest stages of early vote um, that we've ever seen. And so our programs can't afford to ramp late. We have to actually ramp this summer. Um, and on the C4 side, we had a goal to give out 7.5 million to help ramp up programs and do persuasion work. We've raised 2.8 of that. Uh, we have another um, 4.7 of that to raise so far. So um, Billy and friends, thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the work that the young people are doing across this country to continue to save democracy. Thank you, Dakota. And we're gonna go right into Abbas. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, and just shout out to the entire MVP team for pulling us together and shout out to my um, fellow uh, co-panelists, Gracia, um, Dakota, uh, Jennifer, y'all are um, killing it out there and just really inspired by um, everything you all have shared. If you haven't had a chance to express your gratitude to them, please do so in the chat. I'm um, just astounded by the level of work um, that you all are carrying and the leadership that you're carrying into this moment. I know we don't, we don't have much time together, but I want to maybe share my story with you all. Um, uh, my name is Abbas. I use he, him pronouns. I am an organizer with the Uncommitted National Movement that grew out of the Listen to Michigan campaign, a campaign that was started and, and run um, over a course of three weeks uh, back in February to try and do two very urgent things. Um, one, get the president to um, save lives um, by um, calling for an immediate ceasefire, and then two, to convince him that we need to stop funding the killing. And these are two very heavy, weighty things um, that we're trying to convince our president to do and that we continue to try and urge him to do, uh, both because they're the right thing to do to save lives and because to many key voters, voters that are central to our democratic base, young people, Arab and Muslim Americans, voters of conscience all around the country who aren't cool with our tax dollars being used to kill over 10,000, what are we at, 14,000, 15,000 children, over 35,000 innocents. It's an untenable situation. And so in Michigan, I wanna tell you about how I got to Michigan. I got to Michigan, I was a kid when we got here. Um, I was six years old. I come from an immigrant family. And um, one summer in 2006, I was visiting my family in Lebanon, and I got stuck in the war, the conflict between um, Israel and Hezbollah. And I experienced um, something that gives me a specific expertise that too many Arab Americans in our country have, too many Muslim Americans in our country have, too many people who are connected to and love um, uh, survivors uh, uh, know all too well, I had the experience of surviving US funded bombs. I had the experience of being a child in South Lebanon and coming to terms with the fact that my government was funding what I was certain was my imminent death. I came to terms with it. I said, you know what, this doesn't make any sense, but I'm about to die because of these bombs that my own government sent. I survived. And I came back and I went on to become an organizer because I, I needed it. I needed to, to, to work towards a reality where that just never happens. We just never put kids in that situation where, where it's, it's American bombs dropping to obliterate them. We just, it, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a, 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 a sustainable situation. And so 
I decided to engage further. I became an activist on my college campus and I went on to pursue a career in global health. And then I met this guy named Andy Levin who was running for Congress. And he said he was running on Medicare for all and, all, and on all the things that we love. And so I was like, bet, went to Congress with Andy. We got a lot of amazing things done. Then I worked for Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib um, as her legislative director and Congresswoman Cori Bush as her chief of staff. And during that time, especially working with Congresswoman Tlaib and my last three years with Congresswoman Bush, I worked very, very closely with the Biden White House. I know the difference between Biden and Trump. I know that because we can see their policies. I also know that because on January 6th, when I was in the Capitol and the Capitol was being attacked by a white supremacist mob that Trump sent, it was my aunt, I knew that the moment I knew we were under attack was the moment my aunt called me from Lebanon. My aunt, who I survived the war with in 2006, called me from Lebanon and said, Abbas, I see that you're under attack. Are you going to be okay? We know that the threat of fascism is alive and well here in our country. We also know that there is an inconvenient and, and uncomfortable truth that we, me, I'm not, I'm, uh, my, you know, all of us are, you know, through our tax dollars are complicit, complicit in the funding of the mass killing of Palestinians right now. And that's not, that, that, that shouldn't be okay with us. Okay. And so I moved back to Michigan for a family situation um, and then October happened. And for many uh, people who have the expertise that I have of knowing what it's like when a US funded bomb drops, that news of the horrific attacks of October 7th, the taking of hostages and of Palestinian captives and, 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 and the murderous campaign that Netanyahu waged in, uh, uh, since October 7th, that news isn't something that's happening very far away. That's something that we are experiencing in our bodies, okay? Those are the nightmares that I'm having every single night. And what happened in the aftermath is what I saw in my own community in Michigan is people who never engaged in politics in all the years that I've been working in politics, people who haven't been tuning in, people who don't vote, family members that I love, extended family members, community members coming up and saying, Abbas, I'm so mad at Biden. I've never been this betrayed in my entire life. I will do everything I can to make sure he doesn't get elected. I'll vote for Trump. I don't care. Now, we're talking about a community where before October, the sad reality is that the other side has been mobilizing in Arab and Muslim and, and, and communities of color all around the country. They have been mobilizing and 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 and, and promoting fear in, in Dearborn, Michigan, where I come from, for example, there was the, the biggest political issue before October was the book banning campaign, the homophobic, xenophobic book banning campaign that the that the Republican Party had planted in to, to, to promote fear among immigrant communities. And so we knew that something needed to be done. And unfortunately, the powers that be were not engaging people who were experiencing immense hurt in their bodies as a result of our, our own government being complicit in the genocide of, of Palestinians right now. And so we needed a way to re-engage people in something that they can vote for, give people something to vote for. And at the time that we started the Listen to Michigan campaign, President Biden had still not said the word ceasefire. His, his, his team had still uh, uh, been uh, working to uh, push that demand aside and, 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 and belittle and malign the movement for a ceasefire. But our uncommitted campaign came out of the ceasefire movement to say clearly that we need the president to move to save lives right now. And because we know that there is a threat of fascism that is on its way in November. And that unless President Biden moves, he's lost people, he, people who feel deeply betrayed, young people, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in, in swing states all across the country who need to see him move. And so we created the Uncommitted Campaign to give people a way to engage. We, 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 were, we, were, we set out to conduct advocacy through the presidential primaries to build grassroots power in this deeply painful moment of, 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 of the mass atrocities of genocide. 
And we built a multi-faith, multi-racial, multi-generational network that achieved historic wins. In Michigan, the last time Trump won, it was by 10,000 votes. We earned over 101,000 votes for uncommitted. In Wisconsin, the uninstructed campaign won over 48,000 votes, more than doubling Michigan's 2020 margin. People all around the country, state organizers all around the country came together and, and, and saw that people are disillusioned and that we need to keep them engaged, both to send the clear message to President Biden of what we already know. The base of our party has moved. The base of our party wants a ceasefire. The base of our party doesn't want unconditional funding that can be used for war crimes. And so the moment that we're in now, and thank you, Billy, to lay, for laying out, we have four phases to our strategy. We engage in the in the presidential primary, which is which was what uh, which is um, uh, you know what, uh, what we just wrapped up. Right now, we're preparing to carry out uh, to 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 take the 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 um, see the the ceasefire delegates that we've won through our campaigns. We have thirty five delegates. We're going to be going to the DNC to make sure that we lift up the over seven hundred and thirty thousand uncommitted and uninstructed votes that have been cast all around the country, and make sure that. Never again can we go back to the place of being progressive on everything except for Palestine. We are complicit. We are complicit and the progressive movement needs to adopt as one pillar of the many pillars that are holding up our movement, the need to be anti-war, the need to be pro-peace, and the need to speak to anti-war voters who want, uh, want President Biden to fight fascism in November, want, want to fight fascism themselves in November here, and want to make sure that our tax dollars aren't funding a, the, Netanyahu, the purveyor of fascism in, in Israel and in Palestine. And so right now we're training our delegates to make sure that they engage effectively with the media at the DNC, that, that, the, that the media intervention that they're making at the DNC is one that speaks to the need for President Biden to move so that we can win in November, and also what we know about Donald Trump and, and the disgusting people who are around him and what his son-in-law has, has planned for colonizing Gaza once and for all, permanently displacing already permanently displaced Palestinians, and what the people around him have planned for our immigrant communities and our um, and, and every one of the, uh, our, our marginalized communities. We know what's at stake, but we have to pressure Biden now so that he can move, so that we can make sure to re-engage people who he, who his policy decisions have have um, have um, have alienated. That's what I'm most worried about. And so we got to get him to move so that we can de defeat fascism in the fall. Um, and um, the uncommitted national movement has been organizing through our host organization, Arab Americans for Progress. Um, to to do just that, to 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 take this all the way to the convention to make sure make sure to speak up, carry the, the voices of those uncommitted voters, of those pro-peace, anti-war voters that spoke up all across the country, um, and, and, uh, and, and, then, and then pivot to November where we continue the pressure of, but also tell the truth about what Donald Trump has planned for our communities. We want nothing to do with it. And so we're going to keep our organizing going in places where, unfortunately, the president, uh, the president has alienated a lot of people, but we're not going to give up on our communities. So, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, resource, our, our resource situation, we need to raise 1.5 million. We've raised about um, a little over a third of that, and when we want to, uh, you know, we have we have an unmet need of about seven hundred thousand dollars to make sure that we can keep our um, organizing going through November. Would love your help, and just deeply, deeply um, uh, grateful to MVP uh, for the awesome work that they're doing to uh, uh, to support organizing. We can't disengage. We have to engage even in this seemingly impossible moment. It's our only way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abbas. Um, and thank you, everyone. Um, we are going to go a little bit over time into the office hours to talk about how we are organizing. You all are working your hearts out and all the organizers you work with are working your hearts out and organizing their communities. And it's our job to organize the people we know. And we take that very seriously at MVP. And, um, and as someone said in the chat, this is a big tent. We're all not gonna agree with each other on, on every issue. And we gotta, th this is a moment of truth. You know, the movement has been fractured we have to hold together. We have to hold together to stop fascism. That is what we have to do. And that is that is what 
that that is what Abbas is telling the people he's talking to. That is what Dakota is telling from the people he's talking to. That is what we have to tell the people in our lives in our communities. You know, when they say, "Up," oh, they use the word genocide. Can't have anything to do with that. Like you know, like we have to have deeper conversations to um to and and this is very personal for me as a jewish person who's like my safety is dependent on us maintaining a, a multi-racial democracy in this country which is threatened so you know for 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 my grandmother for centuries of people who've been threatened for every reason we have to hold this together and it's not going to be easy and so you know for people in the chat who are like concerned about you know language like this is this is the work we this is what we have to do we have to hold each other we have to hold ourselves so thank you so so much um jennifer gracia dakota abbas and and all the um people you work with i'm going to introduce my amazing colleague regina clemente um who we tag team and she's organizing the donor organizing team and working with all the volunteers. And if any, if people can stay on, we really, really encourage you to stay on because you're going to be here from our incredible volunteers who are, um, who, who, who would give Dakota, Jennifer, Gracie, and Abbas a run for their money <laughs> organizing their own communities. So go ahead, Regina, take it away. Hey y'all, I'm Regina Clemente. I've been with MVP since 2018 in numerous roles. I'm currently a senior advisor and interim director of donor organizing, which I am super stoked about because as Billy said, we take organizing very seriously here and organizing our donor community is a huge priority. That's why in addition to donor advising, um, we have a growing team focused on supporting our donor community to organize others in your networks. We know that you are the best messengers to tell other folks about this specific way to get really involved um, in this election and ongoingly supporting the movement. So together with our donor organizing volunteers and hubs throughout the country, we have raised already just under $5 million through volunteer-led efforts, and we aim to raise another at least $5 million between now and the election. Um, and we do that through supporting our kick-ass volunteer team on individual online fundraising campaigns, in-person house parties and events that are becoming increasingly popular, like the Dance for Democracy model, which we have photos if you want to see, um, virtual house parties where we're raising anywhere from 5K to 500K by getting 50, 100 people on the phone at the same time together. And in addition to the hubs we have throughout the country, we also have amazing affinity groups like Legal Community for Democracy and Healthcare Leaders for Democracy. And as Billy mentioned at the top of the call, Healthcare Leaders for Democracy are co-hosting a call with us on June 26, focusing on our groups organizing to win reproductive freedom to make sure we win a federal trifecta to abolish the filibuster. We leverage ballot measures and we build state power at all three levels of state government to play the strongest offense and defense. And so, Lots of phenomenal things going on here in our donor organizing world and with our donor community. And with no further ado, I have the honor of introducing you to three of our awesome volunteer leaders from across the country. Um, we have with us Leanne Grio, who helps support our longstanding Eastern Massachusetts hub, um, who actually now hails from Maine. Um, Michael Kushner, who helps lead our Bay Area hub in California. And Anne Hallett from our brand new and still developing Chicago team. So welcome to all three of you. I think we're going to spotlight them here in a second. Um, and just going to have a little conversation then with them really quickly. So to start... Hi, Leanne. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, and I see Anne on now too, and we'll get back in a second. Can each of you quickly tell us a little bit about your background and what moved you to become a volunteer donor organizer with MVP? All right, so I'll jump in first. This is Michael Kushner, and I'm in Oakland, California. And, you know, I live in the bluest part of a very blue state. And I have felt uh, increasingly compelled to find a way to impact the national political scene. And, you know, once I retired recently, uh, I really wanted to find an organization that would allow me to engage politically. And there are a lot of groups out there. And I looked at groups and some, you know, were sending postcards, phone calls, doing direct voter contact in key states. But I wanted to be more than another out-of-state messenger. 
And that's when I found MVP through a good friend of ours. And so when I heard about what MVP was doing to enable people to organize directly in their own communities, I was on board. It just made complete sense to me. Thanks, Michael. Leanne? Sure. So I've been politically active since college, and I have a background in meeting planning and event organizing. And when I got invited to an MVP party in about, I guess it was 2018, I was really thrilled that there was a way that I could serve as a credible messenger to my local community, and I could network and I could engage them directly um, in funding the local grassroots organizing that MVP was doing. Um, and I, I really was not good at, nor did I particularly like to door knock or to phone bank. And this gave me a way to be involved in a very important way. And um, I've been reading a lot of Simon Rosenberg who writes the Hopium Chronicles on Substack. And he his one of his mottos is do more, worry less. And that's sort of become my motto too. Um, MVP has provided a great way for me to use my own skills um, and make a difference. And so more parties, less worry. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Leanne. Ann. Yeah, um, I'm Ann Hallett from Chicago. I have founded and run four nonprofit organizations, and I also directed the Weeble Foundation, which funds community organizing, which is how I learned about organizing and how important and strategic it is. I've known Billy since the mid-90s when he developed a special relationship with me and my family that I'll tell you about it some other time. Um, <laughs> And I've funded MVP since the early days, but then the Chicago Hub just got started this year and I volunteered. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, can you each now tell us a little bit about what your specific roles have been in this work, knowing that some of you have been doing this for years and some of you like Anne are newer to it? Sure. So I'll start. Um, so I was a party coordinator, meaning that I um, supported volunteer efforts and our hosts with um, everything that they needed to do an effective MVP party, whether on Zoom or in person. And um, what as our efforts grew and we had more and more house parties, we needed to build our team. And so we've been um, working on a shadowing process for training new party coordinators and working hard on sort of making sure that all the materials you need to run a house party are effective and easy to access. So um, we can be more efficient in delivering the parties in a highly effective way. Thanks so oh, much. Yep. Michael. Uh, well, I also decided that I wanted to work on coordinating house parties and it was a, a, a shift for me because I never was very interested in fundraising. And I realized that this kind of fundraising is just another form of organizing, that it's a way to talk with other people about uh, the things that are important to me and to work together with people. So I became a, a house party coordinator and I was able to kind of learn the ropes as I went from our local Bay Area volunteer hub. And now I'm co-leading the team of house party coordinators and we work to identify people who will be hosts and co-hosts. Uh, we work with them then to plan their parties in advance, to share best, best practices with them and to support them. And, and then to help make sure that we stay in touch with those who attended those parties afterward. Um, I also work as a, a presenter at house parties and mm -hmm. I really enjoy talking with people about MVP. Thanks, Michael. Ann. Yeah, after I signed on to work with MVP, I decided to hold up a house party at my house. So I recruited four co-hosts who are veteran organizers themselves. So it was a great group. We invited over 200 people and about 40 came, which I think is fairly typical percentage of attendees. Um, but a lot of others donated. So that was great. I recruited my grandson who did all the tech help work for me. Uh, and we set a goal to raise $5,000, which in this crowd I know is way low, but we t just have topped 26000 so we're feeling really pleased about that. And we have two more events scheduled within the next month. Amazing. And last question, what do you all get out of being an MVP donor organizing volunteer beyond, you know, helping us save democracy? <laughs> um, well, for me, it... it it gives me a way to do something that 
um, I feel is highly effective. I think this supporting grassroots organizers in their local communities just makes so much sense and supporting them year round. Um, in fact, one of our one of our co-hosts said year round on the ground and that became her motto. Um, and uh, I just, you know, it's just really great to work with people who are committed to the same things that you are. And um, we have an amazing team um, in Eastern Mass and now the fledgling main hub too. And so uh, it's just, it's really inspiring to be able to share time and, and, um, and be with them. So yeah, there's a lot that you get out of this. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, well, it gives me hope. And I think if I wasn't involved in MVP right now, given the political situation in this country, I could be pretty depressed. Uh, a lot of the people that I know seem to be fairly depressed, but I feel energized by being able to be engaged in something that I really feel is effective in impacting the national political scene. And the unexpected side benefit is that uh, it's given me a whole new community of friends, people who I share values with, who I didn't know before this work. And I think Gracie had talked about the importance of building communities we organize. And I feel that that's uh, also a part of the MVP experience. And yeah, I'll finish this off. I'm really scared about this election and I'm very encouraged by all I've heard on this call. Um, MVP gives me an effective way to channel fear into action. And it provides a way to raise and send money directly to the groups on the ground that are doing uh, on the ground before the election and will be continuing to work after the election. And congratulations to MVP, by the way, for 1,000, 1,100 people on this call. Whoa, that's, that's an indication right there. So good work, you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Michael, Leanne, and Anne, Anne. It's so incredible to work with our team of volunteers and our donor organizing team, Alicia, Rebecca, Jose, and Shauna, uh, and beyond. Um, you can sign up um, right now at movement.vote slash intake, which should be on the screen and in the chat to learn how to become a volunteer. You can tell us the things you're most interested in and we will get back to you. Um, it's going to take a lot more of us than we have right now to raise the funds that we need to get to all the groups you heard from today, all of their local affiliates, and all of the hundreds and hundreds of local groups we haven't heard from today. So really appreciate you thinking this is as an option to get involved and do another piece to help us save democracy this year and move towards our progressive decade. Uh, Billy's now going to close us out. Yay. This is like, like I just the, the, honestly, nothing makes me happier than hearing from our local partners and our volunteers. You know, you guys are so awesome. And um, I just, I love, I love what, what you all closed with that, that um, like you're building community. Like we need a, we need like a huge <clears throat> movement community of donor organizers, you know, um, to be like standing alongside the incredible organizers on the front lines and being in relationship. So that that's what we're building. And we're going to try a pretty kooky experiment. We have 250 people still on the call and we're going to open it up for like questions and thoughts and kind of like picture like little group office hours where we're going to workshop, you know, who wants to ho uh, host a party? Who wants to get involved in a local MVP team? Who has someone in Chicago they know who should connect with Anne, you know, um, and Regina, can you actually put up on the screen or can someone put up on the screen where our hubs and emerging hubs are? Um, yeah, so this is this is this is where we're trying to build um, the this is where we're building and where we're trying to build. And we want you all to be part of it. Um, and yeah, so why don't we uh, take questions in the chat? Um, and if anyone it, um, is willing to, to, to actually, can people just unmute themselves and we can talk about getting people involved? 